Tell us about your life as a hacker. Well, um, I became involved with the hacker culture in about 1976. And since you're since the you say your audience is newbies, I should explain that anybody who tells you that a hacker is somebody who breaks into computers is talking through their hat. This is nonsense. It's a myth propagated by lazy and ignorant journalists. True hackers are programming enthusiasts. They are, they are people who, who love to build and improve software systems, and true hackers are the culture that gave you the Internet and the World Wide Web. Uh, and I became involved in that culture uh, in, I guess, around 1976, when it wasn't even the Internet yet. It was the old ARPANET. Uh, and um, I continued to be part of that culture and write code and share code and communicate with people and solve problems. Uh, I've been in it for more than 25 years now. But in your opinion, why has uh, Hollywood glamorized the term hacker as being negative? Uh, mm, do we really need to go into the amount of animal excrement that comes out of Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Mozilla and Firefox. Um, after Netscape, they started coming into the market. Uh, can you take us through that? what happened there? M the Mozilla crew actually, as it turns out, took about two years to actually get their act together and issue something that was really good. Uh, and this was not entirely their fault. They had a huge legacy code base to clean up. A lot of it was very grotty. Um, and eventually, they got something out there that was usable and fairly good. But some people, um, there was a, another group of people, I'm not clear on their actual identities, who decided that the uh, Mozilla, while it was OK, was too big, too bulky, too bloated, had too much stuff folded into it. They decided it needed a, uh, an even more total rewrite to really slim it down and make it simple. And that's where the Firefox effort came from. And one of the indices of the health of the open source method is that the mainline Mozilla project looked at the Firefox, realized that this was actually a better approach than the one they were taking, and adopted it. Obviously, you know that we're here in South Africa. You know, I've been to South Africa. Oh, really? Yes, I visited there once. I gave uh, talks in, I think it was uh, Durban and Cape Town. And, and the, the way things worked out, I was able to walk into a, 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 a user group meeting and say, truthfully, this is a great country for open source software. Where else in the world can you go and see a GNU and a penguin in the same day? <laughs> Well, Eric, that was where I'm leading to. Uh, with regards to the developing world, how do you see open software uh, being involved in that? There are a lot of reasons that countries in the developing world are adopting uh, Linux. I understand South Africa is, in fact, one of them. Um, very mundanely, there's the cost issue. A lot of countries simply don't have the wealth level uh, to afford expensive software licenses for a lot of people. So the low cost uh, aspect of open source is important. But there's something which is a lot uh, fundamental for a lot more countries. I don't know if this is a big issue in, in South Africa, but I know that it is all over Asia, for example, and in Europe. There's a national sovereignty issue. People want, uh, especially where the mainline language isn't English or is in an orthography that's not commonly well supported by, say, Microsoft products, people want cultural autonomy. They want sovereignty. They want to know that they have good localizations of software that is under the, their control. And with closed source software, you can't get that because whether you get a decent localization is up to the vendor, and they may well decide that your local market is not large enough to support that. On the other hand, with open source, you can do that work yourself locally with local experts, contribute it back to the code base, and it will get folded in. I think I, I read recently about a project in uh, southern Africa, I don't know if it's in South Africa itself, to localize um, Linux into um, three of the, the, the native languages. Uh, and that, thing, that sort of thing could never happen with conventional closed source software because the community for those, those three languages is, oh, um, I think about three million people in total, and that simply isn't a large enough market to interest Microsoft or Computer Associates or any of the other big proprietary vendors. So the, 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 the surface issue is cost, 
but the uh, the more important fundamental issue is cultural autonomy and and national sovereignty and that's something that a lot of uh, developing countries take very seriously interesting that you say that uh, recently a distro has opened up in South Africa calling itself Ubuntu distributing uh, Linux. Yes, I've heard about that. Oh really? And yes. then please may I have some of your comments about uh, uh, Ubuntu. It's wonderful that you have a properly localized distribution and things like this are happening all over the world. Uh, well, one of the more interesting cases is Korea. Perfect example of a market that's too small for major closed source vendors to address but they have fierce national pride there and they want to be able to, to run their open office with Korean localization. They want uh, Linux with the uh, Korean help messages and they're doing it. They're taking it into their own hands and they're creating that. Do you feel that free and open source software is a panacea? Is it scalable in any way? Nothing is a panacea. Open source is a way to solve a specific and important class of technical problems but it isn't going to bring about world peace or end hunger or anything like that. Uh, as for the scalability question, that's, I, I'm always amused when I get that one because one of the things that we're seeing out there is that it's closed source that doesn't scale. The reason that open source is, uh, is, is, is being the, the big success that it is, I mean, all the marketing in the world couldn't make the method work if it didn't address an actual felt need. And the felt need is the fact that as the average project size of software goes up, as the average line count of software goes up, the bug load is increasing as the square of the line count because most bugs are unplanned interactions between different parts of a program. And what's happening out there is all of the, the traditional quality assurance and debugging methods other than open source peer review are running out of steam, are failing to scale. So I don't know if open source scales yet in some absolute sense, but what we are seeing is that it's scaling better than closed source production. Well, in response to that, enterprises seem to uh, prefer architectures like SAP. How would you respond to that? Actually, it's interesting that you mention that because uh, point of sale retail is one of the industry verticals where we've had the best penetration, at least here in, in the United States. In fact, if I had to list the top three, I'd say it was uh, computer graphics and animation, financial services, and point of sale retail. So we're getting plenty of acceptance here. One, uh, one recent story is I think that I recall that the um, Descendant Hotel chain is going Linux for all of its remote operations, all of its hotel-based uh, point-of-sale and database stuff. So uh, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of uptake there. Do you have any advice for South African open source pioneers? <laughs> I'm going to repeat a hoary old cliche, think globally, act locally. Um, yeah, you are part of a worldwide movement, but your success, when it comes, will come as a result of successfully adapting to local conditions, noticing w what the problems are that you can, you can help solve right in your neighborhood, right in your country, next door, down the street, in the same city as you are. What would you like to see of Linux in the future? Oh, well, world domination, of course. That's, that's always been the sinister master plan. Blah, ha, ha. <laughs> What is the future of desktop Linux? That's an interesting question. I think um, what we're going to see, uh, I think we're going to see um, individual end users picking it up last. I think that the, the near-term future of desktop Linux is probably in large-scale corporate adoptions by, um, by large and medium-sized corporations that are looking to cut their IT costs. That's something that's beginning to happen now. What's your role in the future of Linux? Uh, oh, probably continually running around and making trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, I talk to the press a lot. Um, I, I get quoted in places like the Wall Street Journal and The Economist. That's a fairly normal thing. So I, I run around being an ambassador for our community to the, the press and, and uh, the business world. Um, I write a lot of code. I'm working on a couple projects right now. One of my most recent ones was uh, I rewrote most of a service daemon for handling GPSs. Uh, that's getting fairly wide distribution now. Um, I'm uh, working on the X documentation. I'm, I'm, um, I'm converting that to modern formats so that it can be webbed. Um, and I just, um, I just revived a classic computer game from the 1970s that I think is historically kind of interesting called 
Super Star Trek. I'm going to publish that shortly. Uh, I've got a couple other things on the fire. Um, 